Hello and welcome again to UCL Global Health. The landscape for HIV AIDS has changed dramatically over the last 10 years. Uh, I remember in 2002 when I first went to Malawi, the commonest social event was a funeral and the biggest, uh, the, the, the most rapidly rising industry was making coffins. That's changed with the rollout of treatment for HIV and AIDS. We're going to discuss this. I've, I'm joined by Professor Ann Johnson, um, who's Professor of Infectious Disease Epidemiology at UCL. How do you see the situation with HIV AIDS and what are the major challenges now? Is everything hunky-dory now that everyone's on treatment? Well, the first thing is, of course, everyone isn't on treatment. And then right. uh, that's a major challenge globally. But if one just talks about the UK, where what we've seen, as you've rightly pointed out, that HIV has gone from being a, essentially a life-threatening disease to a, to a chronic disease in which people are living more or less normal lifespan, as far as we can tell. But, even th but that brings its challenges, uh, both for keeping people on treatment for life and following up some of the sequelae that follow from being on treatment, but it also presents real challenges for those who are becoming newly infected. So does treatment reduce the size of the problem? Well, that's the great hope. So we've moved from thinking about individual treatment, which hugely improves people's quality and quantity of life, to the hope that treatment itself, by reducing viral load, will stop people or virtually stop them being infectious to one another. Mm. The difficulty is that even in the UK, about half the people, when they're diagnosed, have already got significant damage to their immune system, low CD4 count, before they're diagnosed. And over that period before diagnosis, they will still be in treatment. They will still be transmitting to people. So even though now, in the UK, where we've got fantastic open access services, free treatment, we still know that nearly a quarter of the people with HIV in the country remain undiagnosed. And that despite a higher proportion of men who have sex with men being both diagnosed and on treatment, so we think nearly 90% of those who need treatment are on treatment, mm. the incidence of HIV, new infections, have not diminished over the last few years. No so, change? No change. So there's still maybe two and a half, three thousand new infections in men who have sex with men in, in Britain every year. Now, there's been a recent study, I think mainly from Africa, showing that if you diagnose someone and then you give treatment to the partner as well. Is that right, that you get reductions in transmission? Now, if you treat the infected person, yeah. then you can reduce transmission to, to, the partner. to the partner. There is also thought of giving people pre-exposure prophylaxis. In other words, people who are at very high risk, you might treat with anti antivirals to stop them acquiring the infection. But that has its own challenges. I mean, if you think about the situation globally, there's still a large, much larger number of people who would benefit from treatment who still are not on treatment. Mm. So in, in large swathes of sub-Saharan Africa, where there's the biggest part of the epide epidemic, there are still many, many more people who would benefit from treatment. And in order to really reduce transmission, you've got to be getting people earlier in the course of disease and probably treating them um, above the level of CD4 count at which they're currently treated. Or diagnosis. I mean, are we moving towards... We are moving earlier and earlier to... I mean, there was a trial published um, uh, just a couple of weeks ago in the New England <coughs> Journal of Medicine showing that you, you could, people, could, pe could put people on treatment very early in the course of disease and, you would and, and that would reduce the reduction in their CD4 count. But once they come off treatment, they go back to the previous sort of trajectory. So, but generally speaking, treatment is moving earlier and earlier. So uh, in, in many parts of the, the world, people are treating at a, at a higher CD4 count than they used to be. But if you go on treatment yeah. long term, but you live in a country where the access to drugs is intermittent, maybe, yeah. Yeah. where you maybe don't comply with the treatment, is there a risk that because you're living much longer, you're going to actually be partly infectious, you're going to over well, time increase the size of the problem yeah. if you don't change behaviour. Well, that, you see, that's a major challenge. So that for every person put on, I think the estimate is for every person on, put on treatment, perhaps another two are getting newly infected. And you're stacking up a problem for decades into the future. 
And now, as you know, there are issues about, there have been major programmes of rollout of antiretrovirals, but there are huge issues about supply and sustainability in the future. So the risks there are exactly as you described. Intermittent, intermittent therapy could both drive antiretroviral resistance and it could also drive transmission. So there are still huge challenges about maintaining a behavioural risk reduction message alongside a message that there, is treat there are treatments available that will greatly improve your OK, health. well, if, if we assume there's not going to be a vaccine for yeah. the foreseeable future, behavioural change strategies, mm -hmm. what kinds of things are we talking about and do they work? Well, that, well, of course, the time when behavioural change strategies worked massively was at the beginning of the AIDS epidemic when people were very frightened about it because it was clearly a fatal disease. And once people feel less concerned, there's always the problem of, of, um, of, uh, of complacency, of increased risk behaviour. That has happened in, in, in the UK. Sure. Uh, in African communities, there is some evidence, actually, that... They, that, there is, that I mean, I just saw some data very recently from the Africa Centre showing that actually where they are rolling out antiretroviral therapy, there, were, there was not evidence of, of risk behaviour increasing again. So I think you've got to put... You've got to put the risk messages, the risk reduction messages in alongside the... But are we investing? Been very are we investing in prevention? Very, but I think people have invested very much more in the biomedical model of treatment than yeah. they have in prevention. And maintaining... And the, the other thing I think that's happened here too, that we kind of educated one generation, but forgot that you, you can't just educate one generation, you've got to actually move the next generation and give messages that are appropriate for them. So a lot of the... You're still getting a lot of infection in relatively young gay men who... Mm. But wouldn't have had the sort of... But in Africa, we're talking about adolescent girls. Absolutely. Well, adolescent bo girls and ad adolescent boys mm. and a situation where the whole structure of sexual relationships can be quite different. People are vulnerable in different ways. Um, and where, I mean, a lot of the education... The men quite often get le left out of the education story. Mm. Something Sarah Hawkes, I think, is very keen on, that men get left out of the sexual health story exactly. and the, the issues around sexual health are often focused on women. Well, finally, do you think we're investing enough? I mean, are you worried about the whole aid scene at the moment, the Global Fund, PEPFAR? Do you think we're keeping up sufficient investment in HIV, AIDS, and in the prevention. Oh, I think the possibly. real concern now that some of the pet farm money being either moved around or or or, with, or drawn out of programmes, and I've seen some of that may create problems. But I think the real challenge is how we've got a, now a long-term chronic disease, and the management of HIV AIDS has got to get much more integrated with issues around se uh, reproductive health, primary care. We've got to deliver services that aren't just delivered in a, in a tertiary referral centres, or I right. think we're going to have great deal of difficulty in the sustainability of programmes. And thank you very much. Thank you.